viewers and listeners of Radio Universe and Universe TV, we would want to first thank His Excellency, the former President of the Republic of Ghana, uh, President John Ejikum Kufu, for welcoming us in his house. And I want to use the opportunity once again to thank her for accepting us. You are welcome. We are here for one single reason. One of our own, Dr. Mary Chinri Hesse, was awarded an honorary uh, doctorate degree by the University of London. Uh, she has served severally uh, in this country as well as outside. So we can say that she is uh, a civil servant uh, for Ghana as well as internationally and has contributed significantly in the area of development economics. Um, our former president found it wise years back to make her one of her key advisors, chief advisor. And so I'd want us to talk to the uh, to our own former president and find out his interactions with her and what he can say about her. And we are doing this because uh, belonging to the university community, we deal with the youth. And we want the youth to appreciate what it takes to become, you know, an internationally recognized person or a national person uh, in this country that needs to be emulated. And so I will turn my attention to my president once again, our president. Thank you again for, for welcoming us. Uh, what do you have to share about Mary Chinri Hesse? Uh, I would describe outrightly as a, a woman of excellence and distinction. Uh, she, I got to know first senior principal secretary at the Ministry of uh, Finance of Ghana and Economic Planning of Ghana. Uh, that really impressed me. Uh, because still uh, attaining that position, I think it had, all, it had all been men. And then too, I found that uh, after serving with some credits at the ministry, she got uh, appointed to the International Labour Organization in Switzerland, attaining the position of uh, is it Deputy Secretary General, Director General, whatever, which is equivalent to the Deputy Secretary General Generalship of uh, the United Nations. She held that position for quite some time and retired again very honorably. It was on her retirement from that position, I think about two, 2004 or three, when she came back to Ghana, I invited her. And then uh, at, at that point, I hadn't set up a committee to work on the, the constitutionally mandated uh, Article 71, uh, whatever, benefits. Yes. But I hadn't done it because uh, my government had taken the HIPAA initiative because the country, we, we were like an insolvent nation, uh, overladen with debts and all that. And I just couldn't bring myself, on assumption of officers president 2001, to set up a committee that would look at, say, the uh, salary and remunerations of president, vice president, speaker, chief justice, members of parliament, Supreme Court, to say that our remunerations were below par. It wasn't at all. So I didn't do it, but into the third year, I think the Article 71 uh, people generally were feeling the heat and were so dissatisfied. And even some members of parliament were grumbling that I had failed to do my constitutional duty by them. And some were thinking of taking me to the Supreme Court. I so when this lady came, it occurred to me to ask her to be chair of the, the uh, committee that I would set up, General Health Committee, to do this work and to research to see the sort of remuneration that would be commensurate or would be reasonably fair, uh, given the circumstances, of course, to the Article 71 members. She accepted, 
and uh, the committee was set up, including uh, uh, Austin Gamay and Co. Austin Gamay, as you know, was NDC, he had been an NDC. Uh, but I wanted a, a very balanced and fair committee. And they, the, this committee worked so well, researched extensively, uh, looking at this uh, is it salaries, retirement benefits of uh, other nations within Ghana's brackets right. internationally, both on the continent of Africa and even as far as uh, the uh, Caribbean. They did a, a very comprehensive report. And uh, initially, they came to see me. Their first reaction was that the, the salaries were very bad. And then even suggested what the neighborhood presidents, the, what they were getting, and they thought that's where Ghana too should be. Can you give us an example? How much were you getting? The, the, the president pay, if you are talking dollar terms, was not even better than $1,000 a month. Wow. And this was before the redenomination of our currency. Um, so they thought we should move to the levels of uh, our, the other yes, nations. and suggesting many of the presidents were getting something like ten thousand dollars a month. Ten thousand dollars. U.S. dollars. Yeah. That was, I think, in terms of uh, the Green Street report, which uh, my predecessor had used or had launched, and. Uh, I considered everything and thought, suppose the Article 71 people would be moved to this, this report, which was the prevalent report in the neighborhood. What would become of the, 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 not just the public servants? Because Article 71 should relate to the public servants before we even consider the larger uh, Ghanaian worker body. <laughs> we were coming out of APEC. We didn't have the resources. If we should go that way, then we might be inviting even a coup d'etat. Yes. The protest would be too much. So I said, no, we couldn't do it. So they went back and reconsidered matters, came back and said, well, if you say it should be a gradualist approach, then uh, our recommendation was uh, the president should move from the uh, the equivalent of the thousand dollar a month to uh, three thousand six hundred Ghana CDs because by then we had redenominated and our CD was just slightly stronger. Yeah, yes, one is one. So it, the president's salary moved from about thousand to three thousand six hundred dollars equivalent in CDs. <laughs> but I said that would be fine because that would relate well with the general public service uh, remunerations and then with the rest of the community. And that was what became prevalent. Um, I, by the time I was stepping down, the president's salary was 4,600 Ghana cities. That's what was the salary I stepped down on. Uh, of course, uh, to balance this uh, austere Spartan remuneration. Uh, the committee in this write-up thought when a say, president had served and this paripasu would go down the levels, the speakers, chief justice, served uh, like a whole term, then the monthly thing would be computed together and given as, as crashia to president. This is the story behind the so-called Russia, the noise they made. And even with that, the first one year, the first ten year, a four-year period, wouldn't go beyond about 200,000 dollars. For President Seven, very difficult situation. What was it? And then if the President was privileged to do a second term, and then I, for every month on that salary, low salary, uh, the, the computation should be one, I think, and half times every month. And total put together to say thank you to the president who ended his term constitutionally. 
And then they suggested that uh, everywhere, East Africa here, the presidents were retiring on homes provided by public. Uh, in other places, there would be some, uh, another house or so of, where, of the present choice in his village or so. And they had reason, they gave reason. If, so the fact that you become a president doesn't mean you're coming from a rich background. And once you become a president, you become the face of the nation. So the president should be housed in a way, because you could become like a tourist center. Foreigners coming would want to go and see. And uh, if, say, the president didn't come from that sort of background, that would uh, at least reflect some dignity to the nation. It should be the nation's responsibility to provide such a... Unfortunately, uh, people didn't appreciate this and made so much noise. But the lady kept her cool and persistent gave the report. Uh, I appreciated the work so much, the objectivity and the wisdom of it. So I commended her and then asked if she would want to serve my government, serve in my government after the work. And she immediately reacted, no, I don't want the title minister. I don't want to be like a politician. Right. I'm a professional civil servant or public servant. So I then thought of it quickly and said, all right, you won't be minister. How about becoming my advisor, like chief advisor to the president? She considered it a bit and said, oh, that would be acceptable. So I said then, accept to be chief advisor to the president of the nation. And then I want you to sit in cabinet because I wanted to benefit, or the government to benefit by uh, immense experience, both locally and internationally, and which he accepted and so served. Uh, I think in my second term, sit, sat in cabinet with us. And uh, the way I ran my cabinet, I allowed everybody to contribute to the deliberations of cabinet. So she, they would come in at the tail end, she and one or two others, to throw in their viewpoints on issues that uh, uh, the, the cabinet. I, I found her to be, you know, she was quite endowed, powerful brains, of very objective, and well, rich experience. And this was confirmed because after our tenure, after we served, uh, I think she got invited uh, by the African Union uh, to serve on the panel of eminent wise people. And I believe she perhaps is still serving as such. And then much later to uh, her alma mater, Legon, also conferred the chancellorship, the first lady chancellor of the university on her. What are the lessons in what you've just told to the youth of today? Um, I, I like the word apprenticeship. Uh, or if you like, I'll tell the youth generally to be, try to be professional in your endeavors, in your occupations, careers. And that naturally will take time. So try to learn from the rudimentary stages, step by step, all the way to the top. When you get to the top, you'll be unstoppable. This lady, for instance, started as a civil servant. Uh, is it in the Ministry of uh, finance. finance and Economy Planning, rising to become not just the principal secretary, but the senior principal secretary. And from there, when she stepped out, she got engaged with the uh, multilaterals of the ILO. Again, there, rising to become deputy director general of the International Labour Organization in Switzerland, where she served with distinction and retired as the deputy top. And that position is the equivalent of the deputy secretary general of the United Nations organization. So very high. 
and then from there, because of uh, uh, distinguished service, she came to notice of my government, and I invited her first to work on the Article 71 uh, remunerations for Ghana, and then later as the chief advisor to the president of Ghana. Uh, so that's my advice to you. Please professionalize yourself in your undertakings and uh, work. don't rush around, don't try to be instant uh, CEOs and that sort of thing. Work your way up. Get you, work your way up. Now, finally, in the same context. Mm -hmm. Earlier you started with, the, you used a particular word that she served honorably. What were you referring Well, as far as I, I got to know, and uh, through her contributions in cabinet, and also uh, generally in, uh, as my chief advisor, I didn't get uh, any hint of wanting to cut corners quickly so personally, uh, she would benefit. I, I got the feeling her motivation was to serve the government and her nation, Ghana, for, for efficient, efficiency and good governance. I want to thank you on behalf of our listeners and viewers for giving us this opportunity to talk to you on uh, Dr. Mary Chenry Hesse, uh, Chancellor of the University of uh, Ghana. Thank you once again. Her alma mater, the University of London, conferring the, the, uh, the honorary degree of doctor. I, I have a feeling perhaps she has got quite a few doctorates already under her belt, but I, Congratulations, Mary. Uh, University TV uh, is on, and we hope that uh, our listeners would be viewing us, you know, as time goes on. So please uh, stay glued to your sets, uh, both radio and television. Uh, you would see us live. Thank you very much.